It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson's in studio with us. It's nice to have him here. He's just uh, come up from a conference on Internet privacy and identity. He'll give us an update on that. Episode 327, just around the corner. Stay here. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is, is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 327, recorded November 16th, 2011, Internet Privacy Update. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring Wi-Fi connectivity with available sync and my Ford Touch. Now your car can be a Wi-Fi hotspot. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Go to Assist Express. Go to Assist Express by Citrix puts IT professionals in position to do what they do best. Access, diagnose, and resolve. Try it free for 30 days. Visit gotoassist.com slash security now. It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here to talk about your privacy and your security online. Hi, Steve. I don't ever get to see you in person. This is twice in two months. It's okay, but it's not going to be a habit. Oh, please. No. I would like it if you'd come in on a regular basis. It's nice to have you. You have You're traffic up here, the same way we do in did you California. Did you run into some traffic? No, I, in, this time I set my entire trip up so that there would to be To avoid none, it? To avoid <laughs> it. Specifically for that, just, everything was designed. <laughs> well, what brings you uh, to our neck of the woods? Well, I came up yesterday for a an internet privacy and identity conference, uh, which was held down in Palo Alto and spend the day listening to people who spend their days thinking about privacy. Wow, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it was. And so I want to I want to talk about just a whole bunch of sort of tidbits that were thrown out. It was it's sort of disorganized. It was disorganized there and it's still disorganized in my head. Um and I don't know that there is any way to organize it, but it'll be fun to talk about that. And then there were a couple product presentations which uh, are, is going to be of huge interest mm. to our listeners. And, of course, we've got uh, news and updates. And and I know that you did a little work on the uh, Apple sandboxing thing that we kind of surprised you with I last week. I now understand what it is. Good. I'd so love to we'll get follow your take up. on that. Yep. But, you know, I want to say this was a big sacrifice for you to be here today because you probably forgot that today is the day. Actually, I didn't it, was, forget. it was yesterday. I'm going home to get mine. <laughs> that the uh, fires waiting for me. arrived. In fact, they shipped early in some cases. So you didn't get it on Monday, though. Huh? We had Liz got it on my, hers on Monday. No. Isn't that weird? So uh, anyway, I thought I would be. I would let you. This just <sighs> came. I haven't turned it on yet. But I just thought you could maybe hold it Ooh. to see what it's like. It's got a kind of nice rubberized back. Yeah, nice. Um, it's, uh, it's People have compared it to the BlackBerry Playbook. It is roughly the same sh size, shape, thickness, and weight. Although uh, the iFixit guys have done a teardown, and inside it is nothing uh, like the Playbook. And in fact, that might be one of the criticisms. It doesn't have uh, as much horsepower, as much RAM as perhaps it uh, needs It has one. half, I think, of what yeah. the iPad has yeah. or, or the playbook. Yeah. And maybe that's... Some of the complaints, and we're already seeing some complaints on this, um, are uh, on the speed. And mm -hmm. maybe that's why, is because it's not as uh, powerful. Um, it's running Android, and there are some things you can see it can already sign into. Uh, the first thing you do, it says, Welcome to the Kindle Fire. Uh, I'll sign into... It's got all your uh, networks there. Yeah, I'll sign into it. Don't show my, don't show my password, please. <laughs> Although you'd have to be sitting outside, it's pretty easy to type on this. Wow, uh, good with your thumbs. Yeah, it's it's a good thumb typer, and that's one of the reasons I like seven inch, because seven yeah. inch is narrow enough that you can. It does feel do solid. That. It feels how sort of heavy for its size. Yeah, but, which is not good for reader, because that's one of the things I like yeah. about the Kindle. It, oh, and, and in basic. fact, I almost think that that they've overshot the size goal with the new Kindle. I've been using mine now, the, the you know, the $79 one. Um, it's almost too small. I like 
the Kindle 3 that's got the keyboard on it because that paddle at the bottom sort of gives you something to hold. Right. I really... I, I, so you, you don't like that new $70 or $80 Kindle? No, I had to have on. one, but, you know... I, I like how light it is look at it. put it in my pocket. It, it, it acts... It, well, you know, for travel, if you want to walk around, it does right. fit in your pocket better, so right. I agree. So this is now, and we won't do any more because it's now going to download... Uh, the Kindle software, an update to the software, and do a reboot. So, uh, one of the complaints people had about it was anyway. It, thank you for letting me touch it. Well, you can touch it some more. No, it's I'm done touching. To do I'm going to touch my own. <laughs> Always touch your own. <laughs> um, I did play with Liz's uh, yesterday, and and one of the complaints David Pogue and others have had is that it doesn't feel snappy. Um, uh, our Mac Break Weekly team said sometimes you'd tap an icon and you wouldn't know if anything was happening, and maybe you'd have to tap it a couple of times. And we tried some page turns, and you can actually see a visible. Not big, stutter. but minor stutter mm. as it's redrawing the page. Um, so, well, you know, two hundred bucks. Oh my uh, God, for the price! And I look back at what I paid four hundred dollars for from Amazon. Right. That funky wedgie Kindle. <laughs> That's you know, right. Oh, my goodness. That's right. I mean, it just looks like a dinosaur now compared to the Kindles we have just a few years later at 20% the cost of, of the first one. I agree. So if this thing has the horsepower, they – well, and, I mean, we're all spoiled about gigahertzes. I right. mean, of course, it's got the horsepower. If they need to tune it and optimize it, they can do so. Yeah, well, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see a firmware update addressing some of these complaints yeah, in the first two. Which is sort of a short way of saying what I just tried to. Yes. Yeah. And well, I think also what you're it. saying is there'll be new hardware as well. I mean, they're going to iterate. Probably. They'll iterate on this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree. I did get a... I, now, you, I know you got a bunch of cases. You probably end up talking about the ones you got. I got the Marware executive case, so it's kind of fun. It's a leather... Um, Mol it looks like a Moleskine, you know? It's got the little mm -hmm. rubber band on it. It's only yeah, and I'm not a there. fan of cases. I'm... Uh, I, well, I'm, a, I'm a fan of cases, but not of attachment things. I like right. to have something where, like, I take it out and I just yeah, I see use how hard it. this is to attach. It's like you got to snap it in and yeah. Good luck detaching it. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, next week I'll have my opinion to add to all the other. Gurus. This is what we call a first look. Yeah. But I don't know. I think this for for a tablet uh, uh, that's made of glass, something like this mm. is kind of important. You know. Yeah. Um, and I think it looks good. It's got a stand. Uh, on it, and it seals up, and I think this will be and a little one of those little hand. I, they do this all the time in these cases. Like you do this. I don't know. <laughs> Does somebody hold their? Everybody seems to hold their case like this. I don't know why they. Yeah. I don't do that. No. But anyway. Uh, oh, I can get started now. That was quick. So it's going to reboot. So it downloaded the update while we were. You talking. have good bandwidth here. We're going to take uh, a, a timeout before we get into the security updates. Firefox eight. <laughs> and counting. <laughs> and Although Chrome is at 17 or something. Yeah, I know. It's like, my God. You're not supposed to look. You're supposed to pay no attention <laughs> to those numbers. Uh, also, some uh, news about uh, Adobe's Flash. Well, you know, get the, it. The usual. Yeah, exactly. Usual I mean, I, you see, update. I have one line there. Just <laughs> update. Before we do that, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about our friends at Ford. Ford.com slash technology. If you haven't been there yet to look at some of the amazing things Ford is doing, uh, to make themselves absolutely the premier 21st century car company. I've ordered the uh, new 2012 uh, Focus Electric. I'm so excited about that. That That's going to have uh, this Wi-Fi thing in it, where you put a 3G... <laughs> Put, they put antennas and the whole in the family's car. connected yeah. as you drive you, around. Yeah, you put a 3G connector. They have you, two USB slots. It depends on the car. Some of them it's in the console. Some of it's in the glove compartment. But you put in one of those cards, and now the whole thing is wired up. And uh, everybody's surfing along as you drive down the road. Um, it's sort of, I guess it would create reverse war driving, where people would be trying to stay stay close to your car a very good so they point. can leach off of your Wi-Fi very, bandwidth they'll be when following. they're driving down the road. Stop tailgating me, dude, and get off my Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have security. Leo, could you please sure park in front of the restaurant so all of the patrons are able to use your Wi-Fi? The amazing technology going into, I mean, everything from the engines and the drivetrain on up, you know, their EcoBoost uh, fuel uh, gas engines, which are incredible. There you go. Watch, he's going to plug it in. Sheep. Plug it in there. That's one of them little Wi-Fi, one of those uh, 3G donglies. And now, um, here I go. <laughs> and the kids are surfing. Oh, they sure are. Oh, man. They're doing their social networking. Isn't that networking. hysterical? Actually, I think I suspect they'd use it. They'd probably do it uh, with a tablet. It would be more convenient. But anyway, I think that's kind of neat, Wi-Fi in the car. It's just one example of how Ford wants to bring 21st century technologies into what is essentially, you know, a 20th century thing, the car. Time was... 
you'd buy a car, 10 years later, you, you know, you'd sell it, and you would never change anything. Now they actually, you can update your firmware. The folks who have my Ford Touch, by the way, in, in early next year, you're going to get a USB key from Ford. You plug it in, it'll update the firmware in your car. I love it. For, I want you to check it out, Ford.com slash technology. And believe me, when you, you do yourself a favor when you're out in the, in the market for a new car. You must go to your local Ford dealer and test drive some of these new, the 2012 Fiesta, the 2012 Fusion, the new Focus. I'm getting the electric Focus. I can't wait. Uh, just some amazing stuff. Ford.com slash technology. All right. Let's, uh, let's get into the meat of the matter. We'll start with Firefox. So, yes. Uh, Firefox 8. I grabbed it, I guess, a little before a week ago in beta and loaded it and looked at it and then went back to 3. Uh, three, three. We talked about this last week, but I just think it cracks me up. <laughs> not, not seven, not six, not five. They not all bleed memory. Three is the last one that didn't leak. Yes, it is not leaking. And I've had so much uh, Twitter feedback from people who even are now using eight, and they wake up in the morning, and it's gone to two gigs of, of memory consumption. Yeah. Now, there is news just today that I haven't had a chance to follow up on in detail that Mozilla is now saying it's the fault of the add-ons, which well, I is always entirely wonder because possible. It, 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 we put so many extensions on our Firefoxes. Yes. I noticed that. That really does slow it down. Yeah. So um, they're talking about having some sort of solution for add-on and extension memory consumption. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, so this fixes seven security flaws. That is, the, the, the update to Firefox 8. Uh, four of which they rated critical, and there and all four of those are explore, are exploitable through drive-by downloads. So, people who are on four, five, or six, or seven, ought to update to eight for the security benefits. Yeah. And you know, I don't know, turn your computers off at night. <laughs> if you, if, 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 I yeah. thought they were going to fix this. Yeah, well, in fact, I think seven was supposed to fix the memory problem. Now. Uh, there is that cool add-on called Memory Fox, which does seem to be working for me. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't reduce its virtual memory footprint, so it's still consuming system memory, but it does push it out of RAM, which is you know valuable right. just just for itself. Right. Um, also, version eight gives us an optional Twitter search feature built in, so eight can search Twitter for you. It's like okay, <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, uh, it's always, you've always been able to uh, add a, a custom search, you know, uh, yep. the, to Twitter so that you could just do T and then the, the search. Right. But I guess this does it. And there was some problem that we talked about actually in the past where third party add ons could be installed without your explicit permission. And so they've blocked That's that. Good, yeah. And now you'll get control over that happening in, um, uh, before that happens. So, anyway, fo uh, Mozilla Firefox is at version 8. Um, can I ask you a question? You can. Uh, Did anybody offer you a cup of coffee when you arrived? Do you have a Quinty Venti? I got 12 shots in me already. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> in person, you're just so calm and serene. I didn't realize. Good, all right. Yeah, when is that? <laughs> um, so so uh, Adobe has updated yet again Flash to 10 point whatever they are, it's one or two. Um, so get it. You know, right. you'll get the notices and... Right. and Did they know. say anything about the security? Uh, yeah, they fixed a whole bunch. The, the I think usual. 12 or 13 problems. It's not even worth mentioning so, anymore, no, is not. it? not. Just get it. You Are know, you happy that Obadobi is finally killing uh, Flash on the mobile platform? Because I think it, the other shoe on that is they're going to have to kill Flash on the desktop because it, if, if websites stop using Flash, what's the point, right? What we're, what, what we're seeing is, and I, I heard this yesterday at the conference, that HTML5... Right scripted which right. is to say javascript and and the and the the capabilities the hooks that are inherent in html5 really do obsolete flash you just don't need it so it's going to end up that when the history books are written it will be a, it will have been an interim right. technology just like real audio yeah just i mean a temporary thing not everything lasts forever nothing does and this written really <laughs> yeah oh good point yeah. <laughs> not even us so yeah so yeah uh, it, it served its purpose. Yeah. So many sites that are only using it to display video. Right. You know, they don't need to. I mean, many sites just used it for that. Right. And so we don't need that anymore. And if you need more fancy stuff, you'll be able to do it with with the hooks that HTML5 provides and JavaScript. And 
you get more performance. You 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 don't have to have an add-on. You don't have all the all the memory consumption problems. I mean, it's it's very much like, you know, what Windows CE tried to be. Microsoft didn't have a battery operated operating system when Palm and and you know all of the all all of the the OSs that were made for portability came out. So they tried to take Windows and squeezed it in. Bang it with a hammer. Exactly, yeah. and it yeah. that didn't never worked. Now, are you worried that uh, HTML5, because of its heavy reliance on JavaScript, is going to have issues uh, security? I mean, obviously it will. And you can't use NoScript if the whole world is on HTML5. Yeah, and yeah, I NoScript, I think, serves, serves the purpose of giving you a gatekeeper where you're able to go to a site and, and decide explicitly. It's like, okay, this looks like a place I'm willing to trust or I need to. I have no choice. Right. Um, so, so I, I think again we're 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 seeing more focus on putting fences around things. We, we're talking about sandboxing. We have a lot of attention that Google has given to security in Chrome. You know, when I've got a bunch of Chrome tabs open, I see individual processes in my in my in my task list in Windows. So each of those pages is a freestanding process that Google has gone to some measures and links to isolate from everything else. So and and also if if the script hangs you're able to just kill that right. one and it doesn't kill the whole browser. Right. So so you know we're we're seeing an evolution in all of that. Once the world is all HTML5 we'll have to obviously handle it. And so. I like having you know it's like Adobe had too much power and really didn't have wasn't being responsible with it. Right. Too many. There were in too terms many. Of security. Oh my God! I mean, there yeah. there've been so many people who have been affected through right. Flash. Right. So right. it's like, eh, you you know, they had a shot. Right. Um, Dooku. Dooku. Uh, we're. I've seen some rumor on the net that we're going to be waiting a month before Microsoft fixes this true type embedding problem. Which so just to keep catch people up if they didn't see last week's episode, Dooku is another worm kind of similar to Stuxnet, to Stuxnet that does take advantage of a true type true type font rendering engine in Windows. Yes, in the reverse engineering of Dooku, because all the security guys got samples of it, they started checking out. Okay, how is this thing propagating? And they discovered by looking at how it was spreading itself a previously unknown kernel flaw in the true type font rendering in all versions of Windows. And as we mentioned last week, odd that they put that in kernel, but there you go. Well, they did it for performance back right. in the day, right. and so right. this is biting them. And it's not, not the first time that, that them moving gooey stuff, you know, their, right. G, their GDI, the WMF their issue? graphics device That's interface, right. G, GDI got moved into the kernel right. and all kinds of problems. Right. Yeah, and of course the, w, w, the WMF law too. So, um, so by... By figuring out what Dooku was doing, they discovered a previously unknown flaw in Windows. Microsoft is saying, whoops, uh, we'll fix that as quickly as possible. It did not make it in last Tuesday's, the second Tuesday of the month update. And now the concern is that, that other malware will, will start using it too. So all you have to do is cause something to render a font in a an especially crafted font that is able then to execute any code that it wants to in the kernel and that's never has a good outcome yeah so yeah. anyway so i just wanted to say to users to our to our listeners that little quick fix that microsoft has um i talked about it last week it's still near the top of my twitter feed so you can go to twitter.com slash sggrc i have it right here and there's a link there yeah. that'll, that'll take you there and click that button and you're secure and then Microsoft will be fixing it um, for real. I'm sure, you know, for December, they'll have this thing ready because this just can't be that hard to hard to get. Does get, it fix disable fixed. true type fonts or? No, it just disables something you don't need anyway. Okay. So it's no like, <laughs> thank you anyway, Microsoft. Right. Thanks for turning that on in the first place. So just in the news, everybody's in a big froth about this. I, my my own Twitter feed has been full of this. Yeah. Is this supposed supposed root kit that all of the phones have installed by default. What? Uh, HTC, uh, T-Mobile, a, uh, a bunch of phones. It's called CIQ, Carrier IQ. Um, and This is uh, intentional, though. This isn't something they accidentally... Yes. It's, it's like all the carriers are spying on you. Boy Genius Report says 
you know, reveals that, that uh, the the HTC Sensation and EVO 3D, and and that's like some time ago, and this is all just sort well, of look what it says here. 141,046,720 handsets deployed right on their front page. They're, I mean, they're saying everybody uses this. Yes. So what this actually is, this is like everybody calm down. This is a third party that offers a that offers technology to handset carriers to enhance the customer experience. So this this thing, I mean, you can call it a root kit, but it's part of the kernel. Right. I mean, it's. Part yeah, that's of, kind of not appropriate to call it a root. It kit. really isn't. It's it's inflammatory and, yeah. it, and it worries people. Yeah. So the question is, are our handsets spying on us? Well, yes. You know, the, we knew that. They know where you are. They know what you do. Right. They, you know, and and they didn't so need a root kit to do that. Precisely. And so it's so it's it's a it's um, a Carrier IQ is the company. And for example, Carrier IQ themselves say. Carrier IQ is the market leader in mobile service intelligence solutions that have revolutionized the way mobile operators and device vendors gather and manage information from end users, which is to say the people walking around with these phones in their pockets. Recognizing the phone as an integral part of a mobile service delivery and using the device to measure key parameters of service quality and usage, the Carrier IQ solution gives you the unique ability to analyze in detail, now you meaning the carrier, carrier right. analyze in detail usage scenarios and, and fault conditions by type, location, application, and network performance while providing you with a detailed insight into the mobile experience as delivered at the handset rather than simply the state of the network components carrying it. So the way they're selling it to carriers is this is to help you in your network management. Precisely. Network, network load management, usage, so forth. And so one way to think of it is that the carrier always was providing your connectivity right. but they were a ways back from you so this pushes some intelligence out through the cell tower out to the endpoint which is your handset right. and so if a lot of users when they all open a certain application their their phones crash well that's something that you'd like the carrier to know immediately and so this provides you with that kind of you know closing the loop feedback the concern is that in the process it monitors not only location but could monitor what apps you've installed when you use them how you use them how frequently you use them. anyone who thinks they have privacy from their carriers right about what their phone is doing is fooling themselves and and sprint says uh, we just want to know what problems people are having with their network or devices so we can improve service quality. It collects enough information to understand the customer experience and how to devise solutions to use and connection problems. We cannot and do not look at the contents of messages, photos, videos, etc. using this tool. Um, HTC says uh, you have to opt into this error reporting function. It pops up a screen and then you're able to you're able to, to optionally send feedback about the event right. to, to explain we're seeing those screens more and more Google Microsoft everybody does this now yep which you when you install a, a OS 10 Apple says user you, experience yeah. feedback uh, iTunes would you like to send information back to Apple and you know the truth is I've always just said yes I think most people are yeah I'll help you out I want to make it a better product so go ahead and collect that information sure maybe now if this is something you worries you you should think about it but you you got the right point which is they can do this anyway yeah and they, they've got all this it's like yeah. your ISP your ISP knows everything you do online that's, they have to. Right. Right. So, so I think the proper area of concern is what, what the third parties know and can do who have stall, installed apps uh, on your phone. Good point. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later in this podcast as we have talked about it you know, for, the last, for the last seven years. Um, there was a nice vote in the Senate, uh, 52 to 46, to to oppose some uh, some opposed regulation which was opposing the FCC ruling um, the FCC uh, is currently fighting the large carriers on the issue of net neutrality and so the good news is that the Senate did what I think was the right thing um, because there was some legislation that was opposing what the FCC was trying to do um, Sands editor um, Murray said the FCC rule surrendered to AT&T and Verizon on the air side where it matters in return 
for sites on the wired side where it doesn't. That's kind of what Google's manifesto with Verizon suggested as well. Yes. Don't don't regulate the wireless carriers. You can do the landlines fine. Don't don't regulate the wireless carriers. Right. And Alan Paller, who's the director of SAN, said the answer to uh, to William Murray's question may be that AT and T and Verizon lobbyists along with those of a few other lobbyists representing IT companies, are now approaching Enron's lobbyists oh in power to shape federal actions and in disregard for the public good. Lawsuits by the big carriers who don't want to be bandwidth neutral carriers are still pending. Mm. So despite this, there is a fight which is underway, and this is one of the things to watch is, you know, to what degree carriers will have control over over the way they deliver bandwidth. Are they common carriers that are just open conduits, or do they have the right to give preferential treatment to to some services on the network over others? And that's the good news. Here's the bad news. You know, this is American Censorship Day. Today, the uh, Congress is having hearings on SOPA IP Protect, which are two bills in front of Congress yep. that would essentially turn on, as we've talked about before, an Internet censorship system hr 3261 uh and uh, everybody uh and their brother including matt cuts i was really uh interested to see this on his blog matt cuts is of course the anti-spam fighter for google we talk to all yeah. the time he says i need your help please call your congressperson let them know especially if you call them on the phone he says if you live in texas michigan vermont and iowa this is especially important tell your friends uh, let people know about this SOPA and these SOPA hearings that are going on right now mm. uh, because it would really, in effect, shut down the Internet as we know it. Uh, and give the, basically give, the, give our government the right to censor uh, based not on um, uh, due process but just on... Well, and this segues perfectly into another article that I wanted to mention. Ars Technica carried a great uh, piece um, about Warner Brothers admitting yeah. that they issue takedowns for files they haven't even looked at. Um, Sands gave this some really good coverage. Uh, they, they sort of um, created a synopsis of this, saying that Warner Brothers has admitted that it used an automated takedown tool to request the removal of files from the Internet that were obviously not infringing on the company's copyrights. The case involved Hotfile, a locker site, that maintains it is in compliance with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, because it follows the rules without uh, it follows the rules about notice and takedown procedures. In fact, Hotfile provided Warner Brothers with a takedown tool to facilitate the process in working with them. Hotfile is now arguing that Warner Brothers violated the Warner Brothers themselves violated mm. the DMCA when it ordered the takedown of files that were clearly not infringing copyright. The data used in those takedowns appears to come from an automated data scraper rather than a human being's examination. We can't be bothered. <laughs> we can't be it's too much trouble. Warner Brothers says it cannot possibly okay, quote, it cannot possibly examine all suspect files due to their sheer volume. There's just too many of them. But the DMCA <laughs> requires that copyright holders issue takedown notices only when there is, quote, a good faith belief that the use of the material in the manner complained of yes. is not authorized by the copyright owner, its agent, or the law. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing that these companies are have automated scrapers that are going out and just gathering up thousands of URLs and dumping them on sites saying remove all these. Mm. And when you take a look at them, it turns out they're not, I mean, the scraper has overscraped and and now, you know, this this DMCA is being used to, to hit people over the head. Yeah. And that's the issue is that uh, these, these people uh, who don't like piracy, these uh, companies like Warner Brothers, would love to just censor sites uh, right and left. And well, you can see the broad brush and the... Uh, the it, the like how they, they, were, they try to prevent VHS tape from right, ever happening. Right. They, they didn't want consumers to be able to have recorders in their homes. So this is a good day to, uh, to participate. It's American Censorship Day. Mm. And we just want to encourage everybody who wants to know more. You can go to EFF.org to read more. Um, their uh, publicknowledge.org has information on this. 
There are lots of sites you can go to read more. And then absolutely, please, send a, 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 a electronic is not good. You want to either write to them or better yet, call them. Well, you can, you, you can ignore electronic. It's like, oh, well, well they also want to know you're a constituent. So ah. if you mail it to them, they see the postmark. They really want to know that you're a constituent. It's fine to write other members of Congress, but write your member of Congress especially and do it on a, you know, with a post, uh, postage, uh, postage mark because mm. that way they know it's you and, and yeah. you vote. Yeah. Uh, and we've really got to do this. Today's the day, everybody, please, who's watching. Uh, and you know, it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. If you're watching this later, you can get involved. Uh, but uh, I know the, those of you who are watching live, we should absolutely uh, do this. Well, and one of the Sands editors, Tom Liston, followed up with this on this Warner Brothers issue with something I thought was just exactly on point. He said, Warner Brothers' assertion that it, quote, cannot possibly examine all files is more than a bit disingenuous. Yes. <laughs> What they're really saying is <laughs> Just take down that the they don't want to incur the costs <laughs> right. associated with examining the files themselves. Media companies are all about enjoying the monetary benefits of their copyrights, but are constantly looking for ways to foist the cost of protecting those copyrights off onto someone else. Yeah. Just terrible. Yeah. Just terrible. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I think we will. Somebody's suggesting this in the chat room. I think it's good. After this show's over, in between this show and Twig, I'll call my member of Congress on the air. Ah. And we'll just say, hey, SOPA. Yes. Because uh, this is just terrible. Okay. So last week, you surprised me. <laughs> I did. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you handled it gracefully. <laughs> what? <laughs> Actually, I saw, was it, it couldn't have been the chat room must have been a, a tweet. Someone said, if we could have a, a snapshot of Steve's face. Which you, you know, on the stream, on on the stream, yeah, exactly. When you said that they were that this sandboxing was going to be for the, apps, know, apps, T desktop not, not iOS, yeah, but but Mac OS 10 right. apps. Right. So, okay, what this is, this is um, not as onerous, good as the developers have been bitching and moaning okay, that good. it is. Okay, this is technology which first appeared. In Leopard, so this has been since 10.5 of of OS 10. But they didn't require it, right? Um, it's first of all all POSIX based OSs, Unix, you know the Unixes, Linuxes, um, uh, the Apple uh, FreeBSD, you know all of these, even even Windows has these things called DACLs, D-A-C-Ls, discretionary, d -d -discretionary, discretionary access control lists. Right. And, and you can see them if you right-click on a file and look at permissions. There's this very complex hierarchical... ACL. ACL, which, which controls who is able to access that, that file. All multi-user operating systems need this. Otherwise, anybody could tree walk the operating system's hard drive well, and see your files. And root, the, the root user everything. is God. Right. It, but it automatically has no, um, has access to the whole system. Right. So, so what, what this so-called sandboxing is, it's actually something called seatbelt. Okay. And seatbelt has been around for a while, you know, as this has been. It, it, it was, in, it was introduced some time ago. So, so this sandboxing introduces something called, instead of being a DAC, a discretionary access control, it's a MAC, a mandatory access control, which is to say it even affects root users, which is what it has to do in order to be effective. Otherwise, running as root means that you're able to bypass this whole thing. So, um, so the idea is that in an operating system at the API, there you you deal with everything with handles. You have handles to files. You have handles to sockets, which allow you access to the internet. You have you know you basically everything works with you wanting you asking the operating system to open access to something, whether it's a directory or a file or a communications pipe or whatever. the The OS gives you back a token. If you have permission, mm -hmm. it, it, if you have rights, and so what Apple has done is they've created a sort of a, a, a set of of useful rights, 
which applications can request access to. They're called entitlements. Entitlements. And, and the idea would be is an application will only request the entitlements that it clearly needs. And when the app store is looking at your app and and um, um, validating uh, it, validating it, it yeah. for yeah. for approval, they'll look to see whether you're asking for unreasonable things. Right. And so they'll say, wait a minute, why do you need access to, you know, the local network if you're just doing things on the internet? Right. And so the idea would be that the application, hopefully, the authors will only ask for the things they need. There may be some negotiation between Apple and the authors where the author explains why they need access to the local network. But so, for example, applications that don't really need local network access would not have that entitlement. They'd uncheck the boxes as allow incoming network connections and allow outgoing network Or local connections. Oh, so, okay. so there would be, um, in this final version, and Apple is still working on, on making this granular enough, there would be a differentiation between local and Internet. But in this example, if an application didn't explicitly have reason to require local network access, then Apple would, be, would put up a little resistance so, so they're going to look when they're validating the app and say, what did you request? Will they, and this I would love to do, and this is certainly something that happens on Android, will they then publish that when you download the app saying, by the way, this app has requested these permissions. Android does that, and I, I like that feature. Nice to be able to see. Apple has not traditionally done and that. And so the beauty of this is when the application starts up, it, it puts itself voluntarily into the sandbox only having those entitlements which it has been, which its code is written to require. Mm. And if anything goes wrong with the app, it, for example, couldn't get local network access. If it didn't, if it didn't have that, agree, uh, that agreed it just upon... It never can. It never can. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Clearly, that's so a if, good if thing for security. Or a bad guy got into it, or we're a bad guy application. Doesn't matter. Yep. You can't write it that way. It's, but they have to enable sandboxing, which isn't necessarily required. But we now know that it will be as, as of March first of 2012. And they have to be fairly uh, specific about what entitlements they're requesting. Right. And they have to be able to justify those. You know, show that their right. app actually needs the rights that they're asking, essentially Apple and and the OS to give them. I presume somebody will write an app uh, that watches installs or you could run it after the fact that says here's the entitlements requested because you do create a uh, entitlements file that Correct. says here's what I need, to, here's Correct. what I'm allowed to do. And you are able to use that in order to make them a, a additionally granular right. and, and so you know so anyway it, it, it's a good thing overall not the end of the world not and onerous. developers are just complaining because they're gonna have to do a little more work. But, but and you can still get access to all the things you would have before. You just are, are announcing that you're going to do it. Yes. And they're, That's they're, not, that is not bad at all. No. It's not. That's fine. I could totally tolerate that. Thank you for looking into that. So uh, we've talked a lot in our How the Internet Works series about whether there's going to be a need for a second Internet. I, I talked about how uh, someone at Microsoft was talking about the red and the green Internet where the green internet would be would be somehow secure from the start whereas the red internet would be the way it is now and in a recent talk Vince Cerf who is one of the fathers of the internet who designed these protocols um, who's now an internet evangelist at Google yeah. made a, a point of saying that there isn't a need to scrap what we have don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is you know exactly what he said during this conference. He said, what we have is a f a, an underlying framework which, a, upon which anything we need can be built. Now, I would argue there are problems that the fundamental packet processing nature of the net doesn't allow us to solve, mm -hmm. like denial of service attacks. Mm -hmm. Because that's you, if you have autonomous routing and anybody who wants to can put any packet they want to on the internet and it will and the internet's routers will attempt to send it to its destination well you you have a you have a bandwidth aggregation problem that 
that, that creates denial, the possibility of denial of service attacks. So that's not a security problem, but it's it's a problem with the architecture of the internet. So it's like, well, okay, yes, Vin, certainly we can fix security, but there are there are things like traffic flow problems that we're not going to be able to fix unless we re-architect, and we're not going to do that either. I guess, you know, I mean, look, it's his baby. So what he's really saying is, look, oh, we did a good job just to... And I don't disagree. Yeah. I mean, it was brilliant. Yeah. It just didn't solve all the problems. Right, right, right. And um, we mentioned a little bit... Honor Harrington, I've been very good, Leo. <laughs> I've been very good the last few Sci weeks. Sci-fi book group time. Briefly. Just, uh, Chris Thurston sent me a, a note. He said, curse you at SGGRC <laughs> with your sci-fi novel recommendations. I'm now bound and determined to finish the Honor series. Second book was ridiculous. So I thought I would just briefly tell our listeners. Wait, wait a minute. Ridiculous good, ridiculous bad. Oh, ridiculous fantastic. Ah. Like okay. over the top ridiculous. Oh, boy. Like, you know, oh, forget I'm about sleeping. I'm almost through with book one. I, I've been d diverted by the Steve Jobs book and other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mark Thompson read the Steve Jobs book. Yeah. He doesn't read anything. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. And he apparently was, I guess Isaacson was pretty ruthless. Oh, yeah. It's it's and it's not uh, in any way. Uh, a whitewash. A whitewash. But it's what Steve, I think it's what Steve wanted. He wanted an honest book. He said, well, "I'll read it later." <laughs> yeah. Well, and Steve asked. He says, "Am I going to like? Am I? Yeah, are there things in here that I'm not going to yeah, like?" And Isaac yeah, said, "Yeah, there are." You know, yeah. like, so probably all worked out for the best with you know the timing of all this. Yeah. But anyway, I am forty percent, I think, into book seven of Honor Harrington. Great. And my legs have never been in better shape. Because <laughs> you only but, read. No, I don't. On the treadmill. I could not. I could oh, not right. keep that promise to myself. <laughs> But I also read on the treadmill. How many are there? Twelve. Twelve. Well, you better slow down, dude. I know. You only got five more. I know. But <laughs> we do have Hamilton. I never did read. I never, never got into the, the dream, the, the dream void. The void. Oh, well, that that's quite a is. bit. That'll keep you busy for a while. Yeah, it'll keep me yeah. my legs in yeah. good shape. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, all right. Well, I have to redouble my efforts uh, to uh, to read more. So I wanted to share a listener report. Uh, Daniel White, a listener of ours in Bristol, England caught me caught my eye with the subject of spinright cost me a laptop uh oh but that's okay he oh. says hi steve here's yet another testimonial for you if you want to use it on the security now podcast well and what do you know <laughs> uh, la last month a friend of mine mentioned that his old hp pavilion laptop had just given up um and was pr producing the dreaded boot device not found error mm. he was a bit annoyed because he had some family photos on there and naturally he didn't want he didn't have any backups ordinarily I would understand but the friend in question has a master's degree in computer science Ooh. so he should know better mm -hmm. but then shouldn't everyone yeah he was ready to toss the laptop out as he said it had been running like a dog for months and had been running so hot that the adhesive holding the rubber feet on the bottom had melted I suggested that there was probably a way to fix the hard disk and get his data back, and it would be a lot cheaper than buying a brand new machine. Spinrite could have a try at recovering the disk, and if it couldn't fix it, then the drive was definitely toast. My friend made me an offer. He said he would, he would pay for a copy of Spinrite to use on his drive, and if it worked, I could keep the copy of Spinrite. If it didn't work, I could keep the dead laptop. So I could buy a new drive and resurrect it myself. I purchased a copy of Spinrite, burned a boot disk, meaning a CD, and set it running at level 2. At 18% of the way in, Dynastat kicked in and churned away for a while before reporting the sector had been recovered. I left Spinrite to complete the disk just to be sure. And two hours later, okay, okay not two months, Leo. <laughs> I've done some some <laughs> testimonials here that I think have scared people. Yeah. You know, t you know, it's only normally a couple hours. Two hours later, it completed with no further errors. I rebooted, and voila, Windows Vista booted right up the first time. I was so pleased to have got a free copy of Spinrite. I asked my friend if he wanted to s to speed up his system, and said I could try. I found, to my horror, 
it still had all the crud that HB pre-installed on it, as well as two antivirus packages and only one gig of RAM. I deleted all the HP crud, removed the out-of-date AV suite, and installed an extra two gig of RAM for him. He now says his laptop runs better than new, and I have Spinrite to thank for getting his drive back. Yay. Thanks to you and Leo for such a, po a fascinating podcast, and thanks so much for making Spinrite such a great product. It may have cost me a laptop, but at least it got a free copy of Spinrite. Dan White, <laughs> Bristol, England. <laughs> hey, when it's broke, it's broke, right? Yeah. What are you going to do? There's nothing you can do about and it. And it worked. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Privacy and Identity Conference that Steve is just back from. That's why he's in the studio. It's really nice to have it you. It really is fun. It does make that. it somehow more dynamic. Well, it's much more interactive. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sitting, I can't go walk down the hall and talk to friends and eat lunch. Oh, while I'm busy talking. <laughs> yeah. I have to stay here. <laughs> Leo, where'd you go? <laughs> Leo. I don't do that a lot, but occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. Uh, I do want to mention our friends at Citrix. I was just meeting with them on Monday in uh, Los Angeles, and they're such a great bunch, and they're showing me all the cool things coming for 2012. And I'm just, I just, you know, I, I really believe in this company. And I know a lot of people who watch this show are in the IT support field or software support. If very, at the very minimum, you support family and friends. So I wanted to show you uh, this Citrix product that I think is just fantastic. It's called Go To Assist Express. And the latest versions of this are so slick, so fast, so easy to use that you've just got to take a look. Uh, you can even support people from your iPad. If that's wild, whoa! I don't know what is. You know, and, and so you're at the airport or you're going on vacation and mom calls and says, I can't, something's wrong. You can actually do this from your iPad. Go to assist. I want you to try it free. Go to assist.com. Click the try it free button. And the, the promo code on this is security now. G-O-T-O assist.com. And then just click that orange button there. See, try it free, and use the offer code security now. Or you can actually go directly. There's a you can go directly. Go go to assist.com/slash/security now site, which is kind of nice too. That maybe makes it even easier. Then you just go right to the web page. Uh, what you'll be signing up for is 30 days of Go to Assist Express with all of these great features. The ability, well, here's how it works. When you're ready to start supporting somebody, you send them a link. It's a Java. It's a very simple, small Java program. They click the link. It loads 30 seconds to a minute, depending on their Internet speed. It's very quick. Now you're in. You can ask them permission to do it when they're not around. So uh, unattended support. You can do eight sessions at the same time. So you can start a scan on one uh, and install on another, move on like that. You know exactly what you're working on because, of course, GoToAssist Express will tell you what version of the operating system, what stuff's running in the background, what security software's on the hard drive, all of that. This is all just stuff that they've built in because they know Internet uh, support professionals need it, right? This is the kind of thing you need if you're going to do online uh, support. Mac or PC, you can support a PC from a Mac, a Mac from a PC, or even from an iPad. Go to assist.com slash security now. Fill in this form. Very simple. 30 days free. You will wow your customers with the best, fastest, most accurate support. This is what you want to do, right? You want to get in there, diagnose it, you know, access a computer, diagnose it, and resolve the problem. And you want to do it fast, and this is what lets you do it. Go to assist.com. It's fantastic. Go to assist.com slash security now. E, I, we were mentioning the uh, SOPA uh, hearings that are going on right now, mm -hmm. and I just uh, want everybody to know if you go to EFF.org, they have a big banner on the front page. I know it's up and down. There's so many people doing it right now. And uh, if you look at my screen right here, they'll take you to a page where you enter your zip code, and they give you this. They couldn't make it easier. The uh, the phone numbers of each of your representatives and senators, and you, they even give you text, suggested text. You can send an email, but I would suggest instead, and I would like everybody watching the show, that you call that phone number and, and just say, I'm calling, I'm a, I'm a constituent of, uh, in my case, Representative Woolsey, and I would just really strongly ask Representative Woolsey to not pass the Stop Online Privacy Act, the SOPA Act. It is bad for the internet. It is bad for the country. Please ask her to vote against it. That's all you have to do. They they just keep track of all the constituents, constituents who call. And I think it's a very valuable thing to do, and we will do it after the show. Uh, EFF. See that bar, by the way? I put that on my website as well. Uh, in fact, we should put this on the Twit website. If you go to leoville.com, you'll see this big thing <laughs> pop up. And this is what we're talking about, folks. We don't want to allow this kind of censorship to happen. So uh, when you go to my site, you'll see that. And I think every... there. By the way... Uh, if you click that link, stop censorship. You can get the uh, code to put on your site. Let's let's get everybody. Let's get everybody today.
to put this on their front page and let everybody know about it. Um, this is a great way to, to spread the word. So there's a lot of tension, and this is an example, what, what you're talking about, of, of the tension that exists between content providers and, and content consumers. And the, the conference that I attended yesterday spent a lot of time talking about the, the tension that exists in the privacy side of this. And well, it's I have this. It, it, I, this is I am a kind of living uh, example of this because we. This is a free product, and in return for this free product, we sell you advertising. And the more we, if we know a little bit about you, we can sell more appropriate advertising. We don't actually have to pry, but but you're getting Facebook for free, and the tr trade is you give them some information. Yes, and one of the things that one of the speakers yesterday made the point about the phenomenal amount of value that targeting brings. Sure. Because, you know, I mean, in the old mass mailing days, the, the rule of thumb was, you know, maybe a fraction of a percent of the people who received a mass mailing had an interest in it. So your, so your effective cost was hundreds of times right. what it would be if you somehow had a way just to send something to the people who are actually interested so so uh, and not only that you're getting bombarded with mail you couldn't care less about yes it junk. adds to your junk mail yes so targeting is not just good for the advertiser it can be very good for the consumer yeah and and i would say overall the conference raised more questions than it answered it was heartening to see a bunch of people gathered together talking about this I um, mean, there, there were people in the industry who were on, on the side of, of talking about solutions to the problems. There were, there were companies who were, were looking for guidance, like what they should do from a policy standpoint. Um, and one of the points was made, it was, it was, you know, obvious to all of us, uh, but it was good to hear it explicitly stated, was the degree to which mobile devices are a source for far more personal information than PCs ever were. Mm. Because the device itself knows much more about you. It's got your contact list. It's got, you know, so much, so, so much of your personal information is being stored on this device, more so than, than, than a PC, which traditionally has been more of a workstation where you did, you know, documents and, and, and web surfing and, and kept your, you know, you weren't merging it with your phone. Well, now the phone has, has subsumed a lot of the, of, of the functionality of the PC. So, um, and, and of course, it also knows your location, which is, is ad additional information. Right. Now, the other thing that there was a lot of discussion about was this, this whole concept of reputation, which is one of the things we're beginning to see more and more. There was a, an acknowledgement that there's a lot of noise, that there's a, there's a, a fundamentally high signal-to-noise ratio, or a low signal-to-noise ratio, meaning that a lot of noise and, you, and, and the, the, a lot of users try to find the signal am, amid the noise. And, and one of the reasons is, for example, that there's no notion of who, of who it is for example, who posts a blog comment. Anybody can post a blog comment, and they're all equally rated. So right. wouldn't it be nice if there was like some feedback system, some, some way for people to be authenticated, thus the identity side of this, and for, for people to carry a reputation around that they don't have control over? Because what a reputation really is, is information about you that other people have rather than just being your own data. So um, so one of the other little tidbits that I thought was interesting was uh, one person commented, and I, I jotted it down because I thought it was uh, a little frightening, that data which the government cannot legally get with, without a warrant, mm -hmm. it's able to purchase. <laughs> so there, there are laws because you gave it to some site exactly, and and it so turns, it's legal to purchase it even without a warrant. It turns out because you gave it up that the government is a huge customer oh, of all of the data that that we're trying to keep control over because 
It. That's why the CIA investment arm put some money into Facebook. It's a good thing for government. Precisely. Yeah. Oh man. This is so. I thought, woo. There's there's a little uh, mm. a little takeaway. That's really interesting. So, it's 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 legal for them to buy information without a warrant if you have made it available. Well, if it's available on the market. If it's publicly available. If it's wow. Yeah. And so aggregators are pulling this stuff together and selling it to Uncle Sam. Sure. They go down. I know they go down now to courthouses now, and they scan real estate records. Those have always been public if you went down to City Hall or the courthouse. But by scanning and putting them in a database, they're making it public to everybody, anybody who has the... Uh, there was an interesting story, actually, that came out yesterday. Uh, there's a company called Reputation.com. Yeah, special Reputation Defender, yeah. Uh, that, that, that specializes in in helping people right. and back in 2009 someone came to them and asked for some help he had he had he was in his mid 50s and had been unable to to close the deal on getting a job and he finally and, and he like w w would go through interviews and everything would seem fine and then they would hire somebody else turns out when you googled him the first link that came up was to a crime which this person had committed in his youth mm. that he had been convicted for mm -hmm. and had served a year of hard time for. And, and so the question was, well, he wasn't getting the job because this information um, had, been, had been scanned in about him as records were being put on the internet exactly. so this was back f you used to have to go to the courthouse not anymore right and so this was online and and the and 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 the guy who told the story said you know this in our justice system this person when he was young made a mistake right. paid his paid his uh, paid his debt to society yep. but now that was offline how does he how how does he ever make up for that now that this information is online Something I'm very aware of, and I know I, when I talk to kids, they're very aware of. The problem is with sites like this is they can only do so much. Right. Um, and one of the things I tell kids today is you need to – the reason this worked is because this guy had nothing else on the Internet. If he had a blog, if, if he had, had other the stuff – The link would be pushed it down. It would have been pushed down, but because it was the only link about him, it was the number one result. So I think really important as kids – I tell kids this all the time – you need to – I hate to say this, but you need to start creating your reputation online now. You know, if you did something great or made some great music or scored a touchdown – Start a tumble log. It's cheap. It's uh, free, and and have it there with your name on it. Because the more stuff you put online now, the more the more likely that's the good stuff that will surface. About and you. there was actually some commentary about that yesterday. Uh, there was somebody who w talked about going through a process of interviewing people, and what they said at some point of the process was, "Give us your Twitter handle, your Facebook ID." your LinkedIn they do now. ID because they want to do research on you. Yep. And, and, and the point was that they were finding that they were better able to hire. That is, they were hiring people who turned out to be better than they would have hired if they didn't have access to that. Right. That is, somebody who perhaps didn't interview that well or didn't have an, an, an impressive resume, but when they looked at who they actually were over time, mm -hmm. they said, wow, look what this guy can do. Right. You know, I mean, or like, like, wow, he writes poetry. I want to get to know him a little right. bit better. Right. So, the, uh, unfortunately, if you haven't been doing that, I guess these sites like reputation.com are useful but there's only so much you can do after the fact if you i mean but uh, what on, i don't know about reputation.com what reputation defender does is they'll create a lot of uh, sites uh with your name on it and recipes and things just kind of uh, random fake sites so they're spamming in effect the they're spamming the internet to try to right. bring your reputation up much better for you to start today and do it and i think everybody who watches our show we don't have to worry about but that's an important thing for kids as they're even in high school now start start making a reputation for yourself well and be conscious of the fact that that Everything a reputation you post, is online. It's going to be seen. Yeah, and, and people do care about that. And even stuff that you wish weren't online. So, two really interesting products. One is like top of the list. I, I Because I, this was on my radar, it's on my list of things to get to one of these days, and I had the, the really unique 
benefit of the two of the main developers of this thing appearing and presenting. The product is called Disconnect. Hmm. If you just Google the word Disconnect, um, it's the first link that comes up. The, the URL is disconnect.me, mm -hmm. as in, obviously, disconnect me. Oh. Um, Look at this. Brian mm -hmm. Kenish and Casey Oppenheim uh, presented. Um, Brian started at... Um, uh, I don't see it here in my notes, so I've thrown myself off the track. Um, I'll just remember. He started at DoubleClick. Oh, okay. Dot, you see, he, we, so he, he certainly he, knows about this. Stuff. He knows about yeah, privacy, yeah. Um, or lack of, or or information gathering. Um, then he was at Google and worked on Chrome development. Mm. And while doing that, he po he was poking around at what Facebook was doing, and was alarmed at how much, at, at like at the amount of information about you that was going that your browser was involved in passing between facebook apps and and you know y your facebook pers persona and the internet and so he first created something called facebook disconnect which was an, a um a chrome only extension and and then broadened it to just disconnect which is now uh Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. And free. And free. Love this. Um, I am very impressed. This thing um, disables third-party tracking. Now, aren't we supposed to be able to do that anyway just by checking that box in the preferences? Say no third-party cookies? Well, third-party tracking is different than third-party ah, cookies. Okay. So tracking is more pervasive than just cookies. So disables third-party tracking truly depersonalizes searches, shows blocked resources and cookies, lets you easily unblock services, and it's free. Wow. Um, he has, he has, they, they have tried not to have it break things. Sometimes it may be a little too aggressive, in which case you can tell it to back off if, if, if there are things that don't work, a little bit like no script that right. is, can be too aggressive. But anyway, is it mostly through cookies? Um, no, for example, referrer uh, ah. headers, for example, um, and and other headers. It, it, it'll it'll sanitize the browser transactions in order to in order to pull out any personally identifiable information and just things that that from taking a look at it look questionable. So I haven't yet had a chance to play with it because, as I said, it was on my radar. These guys talked about it. It's disconnect.me, and uh, to me, it looks like a win. I just installed it. So I'll know more yeah. about it next week, but I yeah. wanted to give all of our listeners a heads up about it right now. Um, and the, the second thing that... How is it different from Ghostry? Strengths in our chat room wants to know. Um, well, Ghostry lets you know what's going on. Yes, Ghostry is a viewer only. Right. This doesn't, this, that doesn't block anything, but right. this does. Ghostry shows you what, what, what tracking is going right. on. Right. This thing is, is a, you know, actively works at, at blocking tracking. It will show you, though, what is blocked. And it also does show you, yeah, yes. So, so you have visibility into it. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so there also involved in another project, which I think is really interesting. They call it the Privacy Icon Project. And after they got it up and going, they started talking to Mozilla. And Mozilla is, has gotten themselves involved in this. What they realized was, and it's the same guys, you, you, can, see, you can learn about this at disconnect.me slash db. The, the goal of the Privacy Icon Project is to convert the in all companies inscrutable Ill ununderstandable fine print <laughs> privacy policies into just four icons oh that would be nice they used to have five but they managed to distill it down to four um and you you can look, read about and see the icons so the idea would be that this would be crowdsourced that that people would would read companies' policies, <laughs> figure out what they mean and which icons they deserve, and then and then collectively 
put this into this a database. Is, this is great. So your data may be used for purposes you do not intend. Your data is used only for the intended use. Your data may be bartered or sold. Your data is never bartered or sold. Your data is given to advertisers. Your data is not given to advertisers. Your data may be given to law enforcement even when legal process is not followed. And then how long is your data kept for? Interesting. So the idea would be like this. that, and what Mozilla is looking at doing, because there would be a JSON API that would allow automated access to this database. So Mozilla would end up adding this to the UI of Love the it. browser. Love it. So when you go to a site, Much the, easier. the appropriate privacy notification icons appear, and after a while, you would get to know what they meant. Oh, brilliant. It's, it's a fantastic idea. Brilliant. Now we got to get the people crowdsourcing it. And what they found was, as they began to do this, there was true differentiation among sites. Sure. That is, I mean, there were, you know, Yahoo was very different than Google in, in the way they handle... Uh, user data and and um, and the whole privacy domain. So this is disconnect.me slash db for for where this effort is at the moment. And it's green if it's good and it's yellow if it's bad. Yep. Yeah. So for instance, PayPal um, retains data indefinitely, may share without with law enforcement without legal process, but your data is not shared with advertisers, bartered or sold but it may be used for unintended purposes. So that's very, it's very clear. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Love that. That's a, that's a nice step forward. Yeah. Now, final little piece of something very tantalizing is called One ID. It's oneid.com, or you put One ID into Google, it's the first link that comes up. We got a presentation yesterday from uh, Steve Kirsch, who is he describes himself as a serial entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the money behind InfoSeek, ah. uh, frame maker oh, back in the day. Love frame maker. I know. Uh, he says about every six years, <laughs> something comes along that that motivates him. What an interesting guy. He is tackling the single sign-on problem. That is. Uh, he won't be the first. I mean, Microsoft tried this with Passport. And VeriSign. VeriSign with everybody. VIP yeah. and Secure ID and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's why it's, it's easy to be skeptical. Uh, it's easy also to get caught up in his enthusiasm because he, he comes across as a, you know, as, as a high energy, we can make this happen. Sure. Uh, we've got the money. We're going to do this guy. Um, there's a video on his site, which is only about a minute and a half, which is worth watching. It explains the concept. And what they've done is they, they have a website and then the, ins the installation of a client on your system, which, which talks to a remote repository of identity and then that talks to a device. And in his example, he was using, for example, an iPhone. But it, th there would be different clients for, you know, Blackberries and iPads and, and so forth. And the idea being that if you, if you globally turn your access on, like there's a, like a big, it looks like sort of like Hal's eye um, <laughs> on, on 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> it's got a big on on it. You, if you turn that on, then you're able to log into sites with a single click. I like that. And you're able to specify... So it's exchanging a token behind the scenes. Well, it's exchanging a myriad of tokens. Okay. This thing's got arrows pointing in every, <laughs> every witchy way. I mean, it's a, I, I drew the diagram, and, and he just gave a very quick overview of, of the way the thing works and what the process is. I mean, we're, he, he's going to... Um, if you go to oneid.com... You can register to be notified when you're able to register nicknames. And if this thing takes off and succeeds, you're probably going to want to have a cool nickname. So it's like, you know, don't we wish we'd gotten into Twitter? From, I'm like, going there right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get my nickname. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we, it's, it's supposed to be in beta early next year. I think March is what I remember. And pre-beta or al alpha like next month so there you know this is not years away it's um he did show an impressive slide of all the different organizations that he that he has interested in this so far and so we'll see i mean there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem yeah because you'd have to have amazon or whoever had to be part participate right it's yes not, you'd have to have enough people involved that it was worthwhile for you and right. i raised my hand 
And I was like, you know, my question was, okay, what are the economics? Right. Like, why are you doing this? Right. Who pays? Right. And the answer was, it's free for you and it's free for them. So who pays? Until you are using it so much that it is clearly beneficial. Right. And then some sort of a we'll micropayment a or a charge okay. a buck a month thing, something kicks in and he wasn't clear. And other people said, well, what about if I lose my iPhone, blah, blah, blah. And he said, yes, we know, we know. There's, there's like 50 different scenarios <laughs> for, you know, bad stuff that can happen and we've got it all taken care of. Right. So yeah, it's like, it's interesting. well, I hope, he, he, you know, we, we can cross our fingers. There have been a lot of people trying this it's and uh, failed. It's tried before. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to give our listeners a head up that it, it, on the chance that this is the one that works. Right. And it has... The, 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 I the, get some of these benefits from LastPass, but, yes. but, but not all. Some from yeah. LastPass, some from Secure ID, some from right. VeriSign's VIP, right. Right. but not all. Not all. And... And, and he makes the point, he's able to attack every one of those as what's wrong with these, okay. with these solutions. Why people don't use them or that, whatever. Well, exactly, right. that, that this doesn't have. Right. So the idea would be that you're able to, you're able to globally e enable or globally disable this system. So if you know you're not logging into anything, you press Hal's big red eye, and it just shuts the entire network down so nobody anywhere... I like this. ...is able to, 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 to log in as you. I like and this. And you're able to also, with, with granularity, say certain sites need, thir uh, like, second factor authentication. So, for example, a banking site could say, we want to support one ID, right. but we're go we want to require on-the-fly verification that it's you. So when you try, try to use one ID to log into the banking site, it will send a prompt to your phone that requires you to acknowledge it on the fly, type in a PIN or, or respond to something that you saw on the website in your phone to confirm that you've got multi-factor authentication. I'm liking this. I'd love to see this work. There's a lot of benefits to it. You know it. what's changed is that uh, we all have smartphones, or not all, but many of us have smartphones now. That was something that didn't happen. It was the gating and, factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. so there's a zero cost aspect to right. it. Right, we it's don't a matter need a token. Of, right. Yeah. Steve, uh, it's so nice to have you here. Would you just come up every week and uh, do the show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Normally, Steve's down in Irvine. You can catch him at the Starbucks there by UC uh, Irvine. Uh, uh, reading his Kindle. Having my 12 shots. Wearing his little cap. Drinking a big, tall latte. Uh, and, of course, he joins us here every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC. Uh, so you can tune in and watch the show. Learn about security. Learn about privacy. Keep yourself up to date on everything that's going on. And a few little side things like Kindles and sci-fi. And I'll have like a that. review. I'd be uh, very curious what you think of this. I'll thing. have my opinion yeah. for, for our listeners next week. I won't I like drag it. everyone Doesn't through. Doesn't that feel good, though, in the case? and It's a little heavy, but it feels solid. Yeah, I like it. It feels like a book. And I'll just remind people that the first Kindle was a, a, an ugly duckling, too. Yeah. And they fixed it. And so if they, if they could... I mean, remember, w this thing has so much... Potential. Taking it, taking it back. Oh, he wants it back. <laughs> well, mine, mine, mine's at home. Okay, so you can. Play. That's all right. I'll have it in a few hours. It does have a lot of potential, and, it, and with Amazon behind it, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule wouldn't that bet out. against him. I wouldn't yeah. bet against him. Yeah. No. And so uh, I'll talk about that briefly, and I'll have some more information about disconnect me or, di or disconnect next week. Good. I wanted to give our listeners a quick heads up, and I'll be following one ID because, as we said, this, you know, we're going to want to be part of the one that works, and uh, it might be this one. Yeah. Uh, we will, of course, answer questions, too, next week. It's a yes. Q&A. So if you have a question for Steve, go to his website, grc.com slash feedback. There's a form there. Not email. That's the way. So grc.com slash feedback. You'll go through the most commonly asked questions, answer them all next week on our uh, next episode, 328. You can also find Spin Right There, the world's best Yay. hard drive and maintenance utility. Sis Bumba. You'll also, <laughs> you'll also find um, lots of freebies uh, and information about password haystacks, better passwords uh, through padding, uh, his uh, perfect paper passwords, and a whole lot more. Um, oh, Here's off the grid now. is all finished. Is off the grid also, done? I haven't put the link, I haven't made the grid, I haven't made the the pages public. I'm still working on the documentation, but all the technology is nailed down. Anyone who wants to begin playing with it, the grid printing technology is all there and, and finished. It's like having, you're our, like our Xerox Park. You're our little 
research R&D lab. <laughs> and he's got his hands in a lot of different things. He's always doing something interesting, and we get the benefit of it. So it's all there at GRC.com, including 16 kilobit versions of this show for those who want the smallest possible version. Uh, transcripts uh, as well if you like to read along. Yep. I guess that's an even smaller version, really. It's just text. We have the audio uh, and video on our site, twit.tv. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, Steve. Security Now.